Hey guys, this is My Leak. This is the My Taught You podcast, and I am super excited about today's episode. I have Ryan Holiday, the author of Ego is the Enemy, a book that I found, um, I don't even know, probably at Barnes and Noble, and I have been obsessed with it from the moment I picked it up. So Ryan, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Awesome. So First, I just want to thank you for agreeing to do this. I know that you have calendar anorexia. I read the <laughs> newsletter. <laughs> and, and I do too. And so I was like, I really appreciate you doing this. And something you may not know is that I broke my own rule for this podcast is that I promised my listeners that I would only interview people that I met in person. Okay. So we haven't met in person, but I feel like this is okay because I'm such a huge fan of this book. Well, we're both breaking our rules then. <laughs> yes, we are. And so the one exception that I have mentioned on this podcast is like the only person that I would ever interview without meeting was Robert Green because I'm such a huge fan of his work. So Well, I can help you make that happen as well. <gasps> if you do that, I will be you you just don't know so of course no not a problem <laughs> well I obviously I can't speak for Robert he has even more calendar anorexia than I do <laughs> and I think that's why he you know he's able to make these books that are going to last for I think hundreds of years but I'm, I'm happy to introduce you guys that would be incredible so um Ryan I just want to tell you I first learned of you on Tim Ferriss's podcast and I typically don't listen to them in length but I could not stop listening to yours so I rem I was hearing your story about the worker workaholics anonymous mm -hmm. and and then you started talking about this book and then i i saw it this is a very probably silly question and i'm it won't be all silly but is the size of your books purposeful like this is the perfect size it carries it goes in the purse i've it's perfect well, it, it's interesting. I think a lot of people who are creative, they, they just love sort of what's inside, right? So like mm -hmm. an author will make a, a book that they think that only the pages matter or a musician might think that only the music matters. But I, I think the, the whole package is really important. So yeah, the, the book is designed not only to be small, um, but one of the things I, I also thought about is I wanted people, if they really got into it, to be able to read the whole thing in a day. I found that that reaction is really powerful. Like you want people to get so obsessed that they can they can finish it and then rave about it. So yeah, I, th I think about the whole package. Obviously, I wasn't thinking, oh, this will fit in my purse because I don't carry a purse. <laughs> but I, I was I was thinking that I you know there's there's several different sizes sort of standardized sizes in books and and i i wanted it to be small and compact and digestible that was very very deliberate yeah i i was like i've never maybe i've never seen a book this size and it, it is incredible and i could carry it with me so the stages of ego in this book aspiration success failure um at 19 you dropped out of college and you said that mentors were vying for your attention how did they find you? How did they know what you were doing? What were you doing at 19 that people were looking for you? Yeah, it's, it, it, it was, it was a, a weird experience. So I actually started working for Robert Greene when I was in college. Um, I'd, I'd been working for another author as like an, an intern and as assistant, and he knew Robert, and then Robert was looking for an assistant. And I think I, your question is a good one, because when I read a lot of books um, about people, it's like, they're, they're like, I started a business and I was struggling, <laughs> and then I made my first million dollars. Yes. And you're sort of like, how did you go from there to there? And, right. and I think with, with, that, that was always a frustration of mine. Like I couldn't figure it out. And and mm -hmm. I think what kind of happens is the reason it's like that is that things just tend to accelerate when, when, when the, when, when it's the right person at the right time, in the right place. And you've, you've like, there's that saying, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I think when you've, when you've lined your stuff up, it, it tends to accelerate. So I was I, I was a, an avid reader. I was really interested in this sort of one space of kind of like interesting people who had big platforms online, who are into self help, who are writing these sort of historically based books. And so Robert was like, it wasn't like I wanted to work for all these different authors. Okay. Um, 
it was like I loved Robert Green. That's who I wanted to work with, and and I worked until I got a chance to meet him, and then I did, and we were able to then like I started very small, gave me one job. I had to transcribe an interview that he'd done with Fifty Cent for this oh, wow. book that he was researching, and yeah. so you know I I did that, and then I did another thing and another thing, and then you know um, flash forward, you know five or six years, I'm writing my own book. So it, it's it's sort of what you tend to find is that if if you've got your your shit together, so to speak, yes. um, and you can do a great job for one person, they tend to recommend you to other people very quickly. So from Robert, I got I started at American Apparel, and then from American Apparel, I met all these other people. So it was just this sort of I was I was a kid. I had a lot of talent. I worked incredibly hard. I wasn't crazy. You know, I had <laughs> I had the I had all the things that you needed. Right, right. I think you said you weren't crazy. I think it's very the line is. Uh, people don't know what's being a huge fan and then what's being crazy. And, and I know, I noticed mm-hmm. you give out your email address and people probably contact you. And I don't even know if there's an answer, but it's like, how can you show interest without just seeming psycho? Yeah, no, that, that, that is the sort of perennial hurdle. I think um, you want to show that you're hungry and you um, are talented without alarming. Cause so it, it, I think, and I've realized this with, uh, young people who want to work for me, um, mm-hmm. the rare skill, it's not necessarily skill that's incredibly rare. It's not even talent. It's not even the ability to work hard. What you want to, what you're betting on is that this person is a worthy investment of your time. And mm. I think the number, the number one predictor of your investment not being worth your time is if that person blows up in some way. They have a meltdown, a breakdown, they freak mm. out, they turn out to be, you know, unstable. So I think that was one of the things that I always thought a lot about, which was how can I like, it's like as desperately as say I wanted Robert's approval and I wanted to be his friend. It was like, no, we have a work relationship. Like I work for Robert. My job is to make his life easier. If I, if he's anxious or thinking about whether I'm up to something or whether I have Mm -hmm. it together or whether he can trust me, um, I've lost, I've, like the the job is done. And so that's actually one of the reasons I, I talk a little bit about this in ego. I think, you know, people go find your passion. Um, I think passion's actually a little dangerous. You know, um, mm-hmm. I, I think it's often when we're really passionate about something that we get carried away, we overreach, we take risks. I think what you want to have is purpose. And for me, the purpose was I want to learn everything that I can from this writer who I admire and look up to and, and you know, dream of being like and so i wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that i was doing that would jeopardize that so it you know if i was up till three in the morning fighting with my girlfriend that was not (laughs) robert's problem and that was not anyone that i've ever worked for's problem and i and and as far as they're concerned it didn't happen right right i love it so uh, let's see your hope for us when we finish reading this book is that we would think less of ourselves. And I don't think that many people understand that. So we finished the book. We should be thinking less of ourselves. Please explain. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I'm playing around a little bit. I, I think, you know, most self-help books, the idea is to like inspire the person or to yes. make them feel amazing or tell them how special and unique they are. And yes. so my thinking was like, look, ambitious people already think that they already believe they can do it or they wouldn't really even be trying. And so what I wanted to do is be a little bit different. I think one, always from a marketing standpoint, you want to distinguish yourself. So that's a little bit part of it. I didn't want to write another book that tells people how amazing they are. But I right. also think if 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 you're thinking about yourself all the time, you're not thinking about the work. If you're thinking about how amazing you are, how good you lurk, look, you're not thinking about the things that you can you can and should do better. So mm-hmm. what what I wanted to do then was write a book that that sort of takes us out of that self-absorption, maybe knocks that narcissism down a little bit. So what we're doing instead is focusing on being the best that we can be at whatever we're choosing to do. Right. Right. And so uh, I have to spend some time on the talk, talk, talk chapter because I I'm, I love social media. I really do. But my goodness, um, there's a a line on page 22. You said it's a temptation that exists for everyone for talk and hype to replace action. Um, And you said on 27, while goal visual visualization is important after a certain point, 
point, our mind begins to confuse it with actual progress. Yeah. And I was so blown away by that. And and how often are people posting like girl boss this and hashtag that, but like, (laughs) where is it? You know, I don't know. I guess, how did you, how did you figure that out that the mind confuses the talk with the action? Yeah, I sort of hate this idea of like fake it till you make it, right? Like I think it's yes. it's a very tempting idea, but it's actually uh, it can be really problematic, right? Um, mm-hmm. If what you're trying to do is hard, you shouldn't be faking it. You should be doing the work. You have to be laying the groundwork for whatever you're trying to accomplish. And I think right. what social media does is it allows us to it allows that 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 faking that we're doing the you know trying to make you seem like you're more popular than you are like your thing is already a success that you know that everyone loves you i i think <clears throat> from a marketing perspective that's great but the problem is it's there's no real dis- there's no real line between our fake selves and our <laughs> real selves and we can kind of fall in love with that fake image right so right. um i think with social media it's like Instead of focusing on how much better you need to get or how much f- how f- far you have left to go, what social media does is it it captures that illusion and it makes it feel real. Like if I look at my my Instagram feed, let's say, um, mm-hmm. it looks much better than my actual life looks like. No, you know what I mean. If if only because first off, there's filters on top of the photos which make me look like a better photographer than i actually am but you know like let's say i post a photo a week that's uh you know there's a lot of time that's not being captured and so like people can sort of fall in love with this image of themselves as the entrepreneur on the beach you know or the the girl boss as you were saying when in in reality um things are more complicated and and i think it, it sort of pulls us away from the present moment and it draws us towards this like this image that we're trying to project and and i think that that's just that's just really dangerous what what you want to be doing i think especially early on in your career um mm-hmm. is focusing instead on the sort of the quiet work that people aren't seeing the stuff that's off the screen putting yes. in your practice putting in the hours to me that's what's going to have the biggest impact on your success not how good a marketer you are uh, from day one I agree. I agree. So next thing I want to talk about is the chapter work, work, work. Yeah. Um, and it has my favorite paragraph of all time in this book. And I think I posted it on my Instagram. And you said, our ego wants the ideas and the fact that we aspire to do something about them to be enough. Once the hours we spend planning and attending conferences or chatting with impressed friends to count toward the tally that success seems to require, it wants to be paid well for its time and wants to do the fun stuff, the stuff that gets attention, credit or glory. And I mean, I was on the plane reading that and like squealing as I have entered uh, as I've hired interns and, um, you know, entry level work. And it's like people think that going there are more panels happening that I've ever seen in my life. And like there are more people attending these things, I guess, thinking that that means something, but it's not the work. Yes. Um I th- I think the the pro- look conferences can be great and I think conferences in some ways have launched my career so like yes. I, I can count I can count a number of very important relationships that I've had that I wouldn't have if I hadn't been to a conference okay at the same at the same time I. I attend almost no conferences that I'm not either being paid to speak at or mm. I don't have a very clear objective from what I what I'm trying to accomplish. Like um for instance I live in Austin, Texas and every year there's South by Southwest in Austin. Right. That's something like 250,000 people it's crazy. come to. It's crazy. There is probably not a worse conference for you to go to than one where 250,000 people show up because you're, you know, you're, you're one and a quarter million people. That's crazy. Right. Meanwhile, there's some other conference that's probably way cheaper that has a tenth of the amount of people or, you know, one tenth of one tenth of the amount of people. Mm-hmm. And you could have a real impact. You could meet someone, you could learn something you could. And, and, and so I think I, I have a line in the book where I say the relationship between talk and work is that one kills the other. Um, mm-hmm. When I think about traveling to conferences or going to events or doing all these networking things that you're supposed to do, I, uh, 
when I look at people's schedules, I go, of course, you're not writing very much. Or of course, you know, you've only built one thing (sighs) or that you're that this is late or that you don't have time. It's because your calendar is like, you know, going to a conference is not one day. It's no the time you spent booking it. It's the time Mm -hmm. you spent flying there. It's the night before and the day after. And and these things add up in a major way. Um, I think what you want to be doing early on, especially in your career, is putting in as many hours as possible so mm-hmm. that means no talking. That means no faking. That means no traveling around so you can do cool stuff. It means putting in your time. And it's sort of like, you know, they say, like, if you're saving for retirement, um, mm-hmm. the more money you put in now early in your life yes. compounds over time. Right. So putting a thousand dollars in today is exponentially different than putting in a thousand dollars 10 years from now, because you've got 10 years of compounded interest. And yes. I think that's really what you've got to think about with, you know, you know, Malcolm Gladwell calls this the 10,000 hours theory, putting yep. in those, putting in the hour, the hours now early on has a massively, has massively more impact than they will, you know, spread out over the next five years. So the more you can do now, and that means saying no to other stuff now, I think yeah. the more you're the more you're going to see gains from that. I agree. That was, I think, my big lesson. No one cared what I had to say until like last year. And I think I was so thrilled that people cared that I got mm-hmm. on the, the circuit of like and you're the circuit of speaking. And you're right. It's the day before. It's the delays in the airport. It's speaking. It's getting back. And so I have said no this year because I need to focus. Um <laughs> period sure and look it, it's fun and and i think if once you start to have success you shouldn't i'm not saying don't enjoy it right like don't don't pat yourself on the back and enjoy the rewards for everything that you've worked so hard from but i think what you could what you realize very quickly is that this can become a full-time job for instance like i i actually love podcasts like i love the, this discussion we're having yes. but if i said yes to everyone that i have i probably yes. do two or three hours a day and that like wow that adds up cre- that adds up very very quickly right and so right. it's like i didn't I didn't work really hard to become a writer so then i could not write to be in uh, you know online radio that's insane right but like um but the problem with ego is that ego like it's very gratifying that like you've had me on your show you said these nice things you're asking me questions you're clearly involved with my work this is a very validating experience right this is why it i think to a certain degree everyone that tries to be successful sort of envisions themselves maybe giving an interview or accepting an award these are great experiences but like if you become addicted to that it comes out at the cost of not only the the skills that you already have, but it costs you in terms of whatever you're going to do next and whatever you're going to do after that. So you have to cultivate that discipline and some of that, I think, a healthy se- sense of self-confidence that says, hey, you know, um, as nice as it will feel, I don't need that. Well, yes. I'm going to get my gratification from keeping my head down and producing whatever I'm going to make next. If you follow me for a while, you know I say finish something. That's all you have to do. Finish one thing at a time and you will build momentum. Our sponsor FreshBooks wants you to build momentum for your business in 2017. How you ask? By freeing up more of your time so that you can focus on the things you really need to be focused on. You see, FreshBooks has created some really super easy to use cloud accounting software for us self-employed folks who would rather spend their time building their businesses than dealing with all kinds of paperwork. Now, FreshBooks has been around for a while, but recently using everything they've learned over the past 13 years about how freelancers work, FreshBooks has rebuilt their platform from the ground up. It's on a whole new level, y'all. You can send clean and professional looking invoices in about 30 seconds. With just two clicks, you can set yourself up to receive payments online, and you know we need that. You can also take pictures of receipts on your phone, which makes claiming your expenses a million times easier. For your 30-day unrestricted free trial, just go to freshbooks.com backslash my taught you and enter my taught you in the how did you hear about us section. I have a personal question based on you said uh, work is finding yourself alone at the track when the weather kept everyone else indoors. And I wonder, do you feel like you have competition? Yeah, I mean, look, so I'm a runner. So like I always take pride in the fact that like when I like 
when I run, I don't see anyone else, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, this because I did it when no one else is doing it, or I picked a course that no one else is picking. And, um, and I, and I, I'm able to remind, that's something I take a lot of pride in. It's like, oh, like I'm in shape because I put in the work, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. my mind is, is right because, you know, I, I've carved out this time. Um, and, and, and I like that basically nothing gets in the way of me doing that. Like I'll trade sleep for say, you know, the opportunity to go for a run and it's, it's important to me. I do feel like I have competition, um, but I try to, I try not to compare myself to other people because it becomes a sort of endless sort of <laughs> experience. Well, I try to compare myself to maybe what I think I'm capable of, or maybe what a sort of an ideal career for a writer might be. So I'm, mm-hmm. I, you know, it's it's not this, you know, it's not this, writing is a weird profession, but I, so I'm trying not to think like, I want this book to sell more than that book. But I, you know, one of the things that I try to think about is like, there's a group of people who I really respect, like I respect their opinions. Okay. Um, and so when I'm writing a book, m- one of the things that I'm sort of competing with is like, can I, can I make something that I think is worthy of these people. That's that's like a standard that maybe I'm holding myself against. Like Robert okay. Greene, it's like, is Robert yeah. Green is this is this good enough that Robert Greene is gonna like is gonna give it the nod? You know, like that's yeah. that's something I'm thinking about. You can't okay. obsess about it because you know you don't control other people. Maybe they don't get it. Maybe it's so good that they don't appreciate it. You know, there's 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 other factors at play. But I I am always thinking, you know, how 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 do i at least have some standard that i'm holding myself against so i'm mm-hmm. not just i'm not just flattering myself which i think we all know is easy to do <laughs> sure sure okay my favorite story i think in this book was the story of Catherine graham which uh, of the washington post which i just didn't know um i was so moved by the story of pain you know her husband mistreats her and then commits suicide with her in the other room um, but you said that you think she's one of the best CEOs, period. And I wonder what about her brought you to that conclusion? Um, I think, uh, one, I mean, obviously the adversity that she, she underwent, yeah. I think is a testament to her abilities as a CEO that she could even do the job as a CEO is impressive considering she had zero formal training. She grew up in a very rich family. She inherited this company. You know, it wasn't, it, in some sense, she didn't earn the job. But no. then when it was bestowed upon her, she, she, she like, just the fact that she didn't screw it up, I think is a testament, <laughs> right? Like if, sure. if you or I were to become the CEO of the Washington Post tomorrow, like <laughs> it would probably go out of business like very quickly, you know? <laughs> probably. Um, but, but I think what's, what's, it's a pretty objective case that she was a, one of the greatest CEOs of the, of the 20th century. I mean, I think uh, a dollar invested in the Washington Post when she took over would be worth something like three or $400 by the time um, she left the company. You know, mm-hmm. it was a very small family held company when she started. She took it public. Um, Warren Buffett himself made literally billions of dollars um, in profits, you know, investing in the, in, in the Washington Post. Most uh, like, she wasn't this like sexiest CEO. And I don't mean that in terms of how she looks like she wasn't like a flashy CEO who engaged in these big hostile takeovers and was in the media. Right. Um, it was a quiet sort of um, off the radar business that she turned into a multi-billion dollar behemoth because she invested really intelligently. She, you know, she let her people do um, what they were supposed to do. She made great hires and, and she invested in herself in a major way. I mean, throughout her CEO or her tenure as CEO, she repeatedly bought back large amounts of shares of the company. And yeah. as that went up in value, it increased her, her worth very steadily and, and it allowed the company to expand and grow. So I, I think just objectively, she was mm-hmm. a great CEO. But then when you also sort of hear her story, yeah. she's she's incredibly inspiring. I mean, just to be a, a female CEO in a male dominated business, um, to have been born privileged and, and, and to to make what she made, I, I'm, I'm very impressed by. Yeah, I was too. I, I appreciated that story. So I have another question about the book and then some just okay. because I'm nosy questions. Um, <laughs> at the end of the book, you talked about training and you said training is like sweeping the floor. Just because we've done it once doesn't mean the floor is clean forever. Every day the dust comes back. Every day we must sweep. How do you professionally sweep every day? Like what do you do to sweep? 
Sure. And look, I think that's an important point. I think a lot of people think that, hey, um, I read this book one time or, hey, yeah. you know, I got this great bit of advice from my mom or, you know, my pastor told me this or I, you know, I learned this thing from a documentary. That's great. But, um, you know, enlightenment is a is is not an end point. It's a it's a state of being. And I think this mm-hmm. is true, whether you're training in something like the martial arts or you're trying to study a philosophy or trying to practice a religion, th- there has to be a sort of a ritual and a practice to it. So I think that's very important. So like, for instance, I'm I'm really into Stoic philosophy. I didn't just read them once 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and then I know it. It's something I'm rereading and I'm rethinking. So okay. for me, every, every morning I have, a, I have a routine. You know, I wake up, um, I try, uh, you know, my rule is that I don't check email until I've gone through this routine. I don't want to get sucked into the events of the day just yet. I sit, I write in a journal where I sort of reflect on the day that I just had. Um, You know, I I talk about what I'm proud of. Maybe I talk about what I'm working on. I try to express maybe what I'm grateful for. I like to read out of a a book. I have a a book about workaholism because that's something I struggle with, um, just sort of getting too focused on things. And I read one page in that every morning. and, and then I try to do my writing uh, almost mm-hmm. immediately. Like I try to have quiet, creative time right in the morning. Um, mm-hmm. And so in, in what I'm lucky about, you know, I don't write technical manuals for electronics or something. I get to write about big philosophical ideas. So um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm starting my day off. Um, being productive and focused and present and reflective. And that means that by the, you know, by the time I stop writing, let's say it's at 10 or 11, um, I'm, I've already had a productive day. I could play video games for the rest of the day or something. And then would still, I would still feel like I, I contributed something. So that routine is really, really essential. And then the other part for me is what we were talking about earlier. I try to do some form of strenuous exercise every day for between 45 minutes and an hour. So I'm either swimming long distances or running long distances. And that is also a meditative sort of palate cleansing experience for me. Okay. I'm trying to get there. I have worked out regularly but i just i'm trying to get to the everyday point like i'm mm-hmm. my fingers are crossed that i can get there um but well, i think i think the distinction is you know if you're doing exercise because you think you have to it's not it's that's not i think that's great it's good <laughs> for health reasons but yes. you're you're sort of that's that's not what i'm doing i'm doing it for the mental benefit right like the okay. for instance i also try to i try to do a walk every day like i try to walk but i don't consider that walk exercise the walk is just me getting moving and being out in nature and sort of detaching from my computer so but the thing is i love that walk and i love running and i like you have to you have to get to a point where you love what you're doing it can't be oh i'm supposed to go to the gym like right. i for instance, like CrossFit probably put me in the best shape of my life, right? Like I got in really great shape doing CrossFit, uh-huh. but I didn't, in, and I enjoyed being around people, but I wasn't getting that meditative experience. So right. I felt like I had to run also. So I, I don't do CrossFit, even though it might be better for me overall fitness wise, because okay. I don't love it and it doesn't clear my mind. That's that's fair. I like it. I'm I'm more I'm probably in a more meditative state when I'm doing something like CrossFit. So, I mean, I guess sure. every something everything is different for everybody. Yeah, that's um, what I mean. You got to find the thing that you love. And right. if you don't love it, then it's not the right one for you. It's not. So, you were working on a book with Cash Money Records founders Brian yes. Bird, Birdman and Slim. And I I I was researching you and I was like, I didn't see it. What happened? Any updates? Yeah, so I do a fair amount of ghostwriting. Um, I I'm pretty good at sort of sketching out other people's projects for them. So this mm-hmm. is maybe 2013. Um, their agent approached me for a book. I got to spend a bunch of time with them. I think they're probably two of the best businessmen in the music business, and they probably have this the lowest profile. Like most people think of Birdman as a rapper. Right. Um, most people have never even heard of Slim. Um, but they built you know. Uh, f- not only the most v- valuable record, it, sort of hip hop record company, but um, it's it's completely independent. They didn't do a licensing deal with um, no uh, with you know with a major label uh, like like 
like um, Russell Simmons did um, or or Jay-Z did. They okay. they own their own label. They own the masters to those songs. Um, and 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 they're they're a fully independent label. Um, so they're amazing businessmen. The book sort of stalled out. Some stuff happened in their business and they got distracted. And mm-hmm. so I hope it will be um, I hope it will get back underway at some point i got to write a little bit of it but um it's cur- i would say i would describe it as currently stalled gotcha okay um i also read that you read seven books a week um and you said that we should be reading everywhere can you give us some tips on how to always be reading so i definitely don't read seven books a week i mean that'd be like what 2500 <laughs> was- books a year <laughs> I'm that's like- crazy that's, That's crazy. crazy and impossible. I mean, I do know some people that try to read a book a day. Um, I read a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I tend to see myself as more of like a binge reader. So mm-hmm. I didn't, I, I've, I've been busy working on this project. So I haven't been reading a lot. And then I read a book yesterday and I, I have this short book that I'm probably going to finish today. So that's mm-hmm. two books in two days. Um And then I'm traveling this the rest of the week and I'll probably read a bunch while I'm traveling and then I might take time. So it, it, I, I guess... If I was going to redirect your question, what I would say is I hear from a lot of people that go, how do you read so much? And my answer is, um, it's important to me. So I make time for it, right? Like you don't go, how do you have time to eat three meals a day? Or, you know, (laughs) how do you have time to see your spouse? Or how do you have time to, to watch TV? It's like the average person watches, you know, like 10 plus hours of television a week. Um, you have plenty of time to read. Right. You know, you're you're listening to this podcast. You definitely have time to read, right? right. Um, there, there's plenty of time. You have to make time. And look, I'm lucky in the sense that I make it part of my job, right? Like mm-hmm. I, as a as a writer, it's important for me to read, not just educational for me to read. So I I. I never feel bad in the middle of the day, like stopping and reading because it's what I do. Got you. Same. I, I read a lot. Definitely not as much as you do, but I read a ton. And well, I'm not I, sure. and I think people have, tr- sorry to interrupt you. I think okay. one of the things I would say is once you realize the real return that you can mm-hmm. get from reading, like <laughs> once you read a book and it grows your business by 10% or once you have a book and it opens you up to something that it drastically improves your personal life, you stop um, having to think like, how do I have time to read? And you go, I, 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 I'm going to stop doing this other stuff. So I have more time to read because reading helps my, I think, especially when people are employees, it's hard because um, your boss doesn't want to see you at your desk reading. Mm -hmm. But if you can have a bit more of an entrepreneurial mindset, like I'm investing in myself by reading this book, it becomes a lot easier. Agreed. And so I'm not sure why I was surprised to see that you loved Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl Strayed, which was like my favorite book two years ago, forever and ever. Oh, um, you, it's on your books to base your life on list. Why? I just thought it was an incredibly thoughtful, you know, compassionate book. Um, she talked, it's basically a book of people writing in, um, letters of advice to this woman. Her name is, um, Dear Sugar. She has an advice columnist. That's the name of her column. It's Cheryl Strayed who wrote, uh, Wild, which was that Reese Witherspoon movie. But she's just an incredibly, I think, deep and thoughtful person. Um, and, and a lot of the people that are writing in are either struggling with some like demon or difficulty in their personal life, or they have some ambition to be an artist or, you know, to change the world in some way. And I just thought, I just thought the advice is really good. You know, one of the things that I am cognizant of is like, you know, as a white man, Mm -hmm. I, History tends to be a lot of white men talking to white men. Right. And so um, as much as I love history and I love the classics, and I think you could probably go your whole life um, and never step outside them and still be really smart. I do try to read from different people and different voices. And so when someone that I respect recommends like a book by a woman um, that I was not familiar with, I, I like I make an I make a distinct effort to go like, okay, that's going in the queue. Like, I'm going to read that. Um, And a friend, uh, a a friend uh, that I went to high school with, she she told me about the book, and I read it, and I was like, this is amazing. And and so I, I I try to also, you know, pay that process forward as well. It's awesome. She has a podcast too, and I found it uh, at the airport on like the top sellers list, and I was like, oh really? Yeah, I, I didn't even know who she was, and I found it at the airport, and I I read it like on the plane. It's so amazing. 
So I have to ask this because it would just be wrong of me not to. How okay. has Robert Greene had an impact on your work today? I'm actually I'm actually in the middle of writing an article about this um, because I, I just feel so indebted to this person. And I was on my drive to my office this morning. I was listening to an interview that Robert did on Michael Gervais' podcast, who's the okay. team psychologist for the Seattle um, Seahawks. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I just... First off, I think Robert's books are completely life changing, and anyone who hasn't read them should should read them. Agreed. But Robert Robert was I, I consider myself his apprentice. Mm-hmm. Um, he trained me in how to be a writer. He trained me in how to sort of live a writer's life, and he was also just a model, I think, for me of behavior for a person who's well read, who's um, who's who's intelligent, who has talent. Um, who's been successful, you know, like Robert, Robert doesn't live in some big ostentatious house, you know, he doesn't, um, he's very private and quiet. And what matters to, you know, he doesn't get distracted. What matters to him is doing work that he's proud of, um, and having an impact through that work. And he doesn't, you know, he, like, I, I think I've said this before, but like, um, I remember when I would work for Robert, I would call him and he wouldn't answer. And then, you know, he might call me back like a day or two days later. And I was like, you know, it's like, you know, this is it's the, it's the year 2005. Like, who takes two days to get back to someone? I always thought that was weird. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that actually Robert is just so disciplined. Wow. And talking to me was just relatively low on his priority list, you know, that that he was like, I see that, like, and I know what it's like to be a writer now. So it's like he's sitting at his desk and his phone is going off Mm -hmm. and he somehow has the strength to not answer his phone and to stay on the task at hand. And then maybe he doesn't get back to it for like a day. I just find that very, for like, I try to think a lot in my own life, like what would Robert do in this situation? And um, usually it's, it's the right thing to do for me. Okay. Yeah, that is incredible. I wish that I had the discipline to take two days to get back to someone. I mean, it's crazy. It it (laughs) seems like a small thing, but it's actually like, like if you told me that Robert could deadlift like 400 pounds, I would actually think that that's less impressive than his like (laughs) discipline about like maintaining his sort of quiet, creative space. Yes. Awesome. Well, Ryan, that was actually all I had for you. I right. didn't want to hold you. It's ryanholiday.net and at Ryan Holiday on the interwebs. Well, actually, one last like curious question. I noticed you on your website and in the back of your book, you are not looking at the camera or showing your face. Why? Um, yes, I've never been asked that before. Uh, I, I don't know what I think they were cool looking pictures on on both in both both yeah. cases. Um, but I don't know. I'm sort of a private you know introverted person so i'm I'm not really in, in that into like posing for photos and stuff so okay um, those i i choose the photos so it wasn't like but it wasn't like some massive artistic statement i just thought hey i like those okay yeah i know and that was me probably being deep like i notice he's not looking at the camera or showing his face why is that um is he shy does he not want people i mean it's probably a little bit of all those little, things yeah and do people stop you in the street like hey is that you or or can you live a pretty normal life on your farm in austin um i mean i i live like out of town so i'm i'm already sort of oh, and yeah. I, you know i don't live in new york or los angeles on purpose but th- it, it 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 has been crazy to be you know occasionally recognized on the street it's not something that i think is typical for writing is not you know it's not like being on television or something right Um, so i i do find it very flattering and surprising when that happens but it does not happen so often that i'm hiding my face in my books (laughs) to prevent it from happening that would be a very good problem to have uh but one that i do not happen to have awesome well thank you so much for doing this you don't know how much you made my whole day when you reply that you would do it and i'm a huge fan of the work that you do this book is amazing i think everyone should read ego is the enemy and i am using um the daily stoic i bought that oh, awesome. I think when i emailed you back saying oh yeah and then i realized i had already bought it i was just oh, waiting so cool. i was waiting for the new year to start it so <laughs> <laughs> thank you for everything um and i'll have this up soon